So the next speaker is Alex Johnson. Uh, Alex is a postdoctoral research fellow in Omar Ahmed's uh, clinical neuroscience team. Dr. Omar Ahmed, if you remember, is uh, the head of one of our Catalyst projects uh, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Center. Uh, and so their work is focused on brain rhythms, neuropsychiatric circuits, and translational therapeutics. And so Alex is going to talk about the brain rhythms as potential biomarkers in Parkinson's disease. So welcome, Alex. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. My name is Alex. And today I'm going to be uh, introducing some really cool research that the team I'm a part of, the Omar Ahmed Lab, has been doing where we've actually discovered a new brain rhythm in a part of the brain called the retrosplenial cortex. And if our hypotheses are true, perhaps someday in the future, we may be able to use the presence or uh, features of this brain rhythm to help predict symptom trajectories for people who are living with Parkinson's disease. So there's quite a lot that we have to cover to introduce that brain rhythm. Uh, first, I'm going to be just talking about what are rhythms to us and our team, how do scientists like to dissect rhythms and really categorize them. That'll help us uh, talk about what brain rhythms are in specific and the different types of brain rhythms that scientists have uh, been able to classify when we see them um, and uh, then we'll be talking about how brain rhythms even form in the brain, right? Uh, in a lot of ways, some scientists think of these brain rhythms as exhaust fumes of what the brain is doing. And so by talking about how brain rhythms actually are formed, we can understand why these exhaust fumes might be really informative for understanding the mechanisms of the brain. And then we're going to talk about why brain rhythms in particular are uh, interesting for people who are living with Parkinson's disease. And that'll help us get back into the region of the brain, retrosplenial cortex that I had mentioned. And ultimately, I'll be introducing that new brain rhythm that we call splines in order to um, suggest a future where we might be able to just listen to those exhaust fumes coming out of your head and predict how, um, how well your cognitive ability might change in the future, right? So quite a lot to cover, and um, so let's just get right into it. What are rhythms? And if you were to ask me what a rhythm is, it's really anything that repeats over time. So you might think of going to your favorite beach and seeing the tides come in and go out in a rhythmic way, and this, um, tidal rhythm is actually controlled by the different orbits of the Earth around the sun and the moon around the Earth. And that's why it doesn't look so uh, nice and even. But there's other rhythms that are maybe a little bit more personal to us, such as our heartbeat. Not only does your heartbeat occur regularly in time, but the shape of your heartbeat, this increase and decrease in the musculature of the heart, happens in a very rhythmic fashion as well. And so a cardiologist might use the shape or rhythm of the heartbeat to understand the, the systems that are controlling the heart and maybe help diagnose something that's going on. Or if you're like me, you think of rhythms and you think of music because what's a good song without a rhythm? And these rhythms, again, are created by the, by the repeated, uh, you know, use of certain instruments, particularly drums. And uh, like I was mentioning, you can use the features of these rhythms to help understand the systems that are generating them. And in the laboratory, two main features that we'll use to analyze these rhythms are things called frequency. So how frequent is this rhythm occurring if you're uh, tide is coming in and going out faster, that might tell you something about the relative orbits of the Earth and the Moon. So it gives you a clue as to the system generating that rhythm. And we might also talk about the amplitude or how intense this rhythm is. You know, a cardiologist may be looking at your EKG, at how the, the heartbeat looks, and find that a certain 
portion of the heartbeat is bigger or smaller than it ought to be, and they will use that to help diagnose um, a medical condition. So a uh, higher amplitude signal, you know, it would look just bigger. It's a bigger deviation from the normal, and a higher frequency signal would just have more bumps in it for something that's rhythmic, right? And by thinking in these two ways, the amplitude and the frequency, we're going to be able to dissect these systems, and in particular, the very complex system of your brain. The reason that we'll be able to do this is because your brain, your neighbor's brain and everyone's brain, is generating a relatively weak electrical field around it, such that if I were to put a sensitive electrode somewhere on your scalp, depending on where I put it and depending on what you're doing, we would be able to record the voltage of that electrical field fluctuate in a rhythmic fashion. And that's exactly what early pioneers and inventors of EEG, or electroencephalogram, were doing. And they were stricken by the fact that at certain moments, the voltage of the brain was oscillating at 10 hertz. This became the very first brain rhythm known to scientists called the alpha rhythm. And ever since then, we've been a little obsessed by looking at these EEGs, both with respect to what's the amplitude of the signal and how fast is the signal going, in order to characterize different brain rhythms. Now, I say different brain rhythms because depending on what you're doing at any given time, the recorded signal of that electrical field outside your head will fluctuate at different frequencies. So for example, when you're asleep, we would expect to see, oh, the cursor's not showing up. We would expect to see the bottom trace down there, the delta wave. And that's because um, we know that when people are sleeping and you put an EEG on them, the voltage of the brain just outside is fluctuating at about one hertz. So it's going up and down about one time per second. Thought of another way, if you were to put an EEG on someone and not know what they're doing, and you saw a delta rhythm, you might assume that that person is asleep or going into a sleep state. And so scientists and medical professionals have used our understanding of these different brain rhythms when they show up, what's the frequency of them, and what's the amplitude of them, to try and get insights into neuropsychiatric conditions such as epilepsy, where you might see these rhythms at uh, pathologically high amplitude. And one uh, really good insight that we have into how these exhaust fumes, as some people put them, translate into brain activity can be understood a little bit better if we uh, zoom in to just a single neuron. So this giant purple neuron up here, it's uh, just representative of the billions and billions of neurons that you've got inside your head. Probably none of the neurons in your head will look exactly like that. They come in many different shapes and many different sizes, but they all have one thing in common, and that is something called dynamic polarization. And this becomes very important to understand how brain rhythms are, are formed in the brain. What do they represent for us? That dynamic polarization is a uh, scientific way of just saying that the neuron has two different parts. So it has over there on the left-hand side what we call the dendrites, or the listening part. That's where all those signals are coming in from the other neurons elsewhere in the brain. And all the way over on the other side, on the right side of our neuron, we have what I call the talking end, or the axon terminals. And these two regions don't have to be nearby each other, and in fact, we'll see oftentimes where the listening end is very far away from where it's sending its signals. But it uh, will give us a clue as to what these brain rhythms represent, because I'll be showing that the brain rhythms are actually representing the signals coming into these different neurons. In order to illustrate that, we'll have to imagine our purple neuron receiving a few different signals from other 
neurons axon terminals here. One important aspect of the neurons, however, is that they are all electrically charged. That's the, the language of a neuron seems to be electricity in some ways. And so it will always maintain a small voltage to it. And if a signal were to come into our neuron, we might call that an excitation signal. And we would call it an excitation signal because it's directing our neuron to gobble up what are known as excitatory ions. These are small pieces of salt, usually it's sodium, calcium, or potassium. And these small pieces of salt carry with them a little bit of static charge, such that when our neuron is gobbling them up, we can actually see a change in the voltage as recorded by an electrode. Now, if this excitation signal were to be much bigger, it would direct our neuron to gobble up many more of these excitatory ions, and we would see something really special in the neuroscience world. We would see that voltage spike up and do something called an action potential. And these action potentials are really, really important for understanding the way the brain is relaying information from neuron to neuron. Because when we see action potentials in the lab, that tells us that the neuron we're recording just released its own signal at its axon terminals, wherever they may be. However, not every signal is going to come in as excitatory. It's really important to maintain a balance between excitatory and inhibitory neurons, or inhibitory signals, and what makes a signal inhibitory is just that it's telling our neuron to gobble up different ions. These inhibitory ions are going to be things like chloride that have the opposite electrical charge as the excitatory ions. And so when our electrically charged neuron is gobbling up these inhibitory ions, we actually see the voltage deflect in the opposite direction as we were seeing with the excitatory ions. Now, it would probably be the gold standard in neuroscience to be able to get this high-resolution voltage recording from every single neuron in the brain throughout an entire day, because that would tell us, you know, where is information going in the brain? This neuron had an action potential, and then this neuron had one, and then that one had one. However, we don't have the technology to really look at the brain at that high scale. Instead, what we'll do much more often is take just a single electrode and place it into a region of the brain. Now, the brain does us a little favor here in that neurons that are in the same brain region, they'll often have their dendrites, that listening portion, situated very nearby one another. That's important for us with our single electrode because our electrode isn't able to distinguish the signals coming in from, let's say, that red neuron as opposed to that blue neuron. What we would see instead is the sum total change of all the neurons nearby our electrode so that if one neuron got an excitatory input and another one got an inhibitory input, they would cancel each other out. But it's uh, kind of a, another favor the brain gives us that neurons that are nearby one another will on occasion receive the same kinds of signals at the same time. And when that happens, we see on the black trace on the bottom there that we see a very large deflection in the voltage that our electrode is able to record. So when we see that voltage deflecting uh, in a big way, in a negative fashion, we might think that all the nearby neurons were receiving an inhibitory input. Uh, on the other hand, if they, the voltage went up, we'd say those neurons were receiving an excitatory input. And that's how we get to brain waves, because brain waves and brain rhythms are going to be an organized input signal to that brain region. Right? So that if we were to have an electrode just outside your brain, and see something we call the theta rhythm, that's at seven hertz, that would tell us as neuroscientists that the neurons we're getting that signal from are receiving an organized signal at seven hertz. They're getting those inputs seven times a second. And that's really important for us because 
the brain seems to handle signals coming in at one frequency a little bit different than signals coming in at another frequency. So if we were to see a theta oscillation or theta rhythm at one time, and then see a beta rhythm at another time in the same region, those same neurons are probably participating in both of those rhythms. However, the brain is organizing its signals that are being sent around in a different way. And it's that difference in how the signals are being sent around the brain in this frequency domain that seems to underlie the functionality of these brain rhythms. It seems to underlie why we might see a theta rhythm when you're engaged with a task and a delta rhythm when you're going to sleep. It has to do with those different input schemas that the brain is trying to use. This is really important for the splines rhythm that I'll be introducing in a few slides because we believe that the splines rhythm is only present during times of cognitive engagement. So when you're doing something that requires a lot of thinking or um, you know, you're, you're not quite sure where to navigate, you're deliberating about what to do, we would definitely expect to see this spline rhythm. And that becomes really important for um, translating this research to people who are living with Parkinson's disease because while one of the most striking symptoms in Parkinson's disease is this change in how people are able to move around, called those motor symptoms, we also know more and more in the last few decades that other symptoms can accompany the, the progression of living with Parkinson's disease. And in particular, cognitive changes seem to accompany and be very disruptive to the day-to-day -day life for some people. But Cognition is kind of a general term. It encompasses a whole lot of things, right? I don't think we're ever not cognizing about something, but there's a particular type of cognition that I wanna focus on here, and I think it's best illustrated by this person who's recounting their experience living with Parkinson's disease. And they say, I used to walk alone in the wood, fog or no fog. But when the symptoms of Parkinson's disease appeared, I noticed I could not orient myself anymore. And in the case of fog, I got lost. Now, I am too disabled to get lost. And what this person is explaining is a significant change of how they perceive and interact with the spaces that they presumably know very well. It should be the wood outside their house. So, What's going on here? And to address that question, I think it's important to look at what other conditions might give us a similar type of change in cognition. And people who have received uh, or acquired brain damage to a specific region of the brain called retrosplenial cortex, that's that little black Nike swoosh on the brain there, um, that brain section is if you just took a section right down the middle of, of your head, right? Retrosplenial cortex is right in the middle there, sitting behind what's known as the splenium of the corpus callosum. Corpus callosum is this super highway connecting your right brain and your left brain. And retrosplenial cortex seems to be in a very privileged position to have access to a lot of that signal. Um, and that shouldn't be too much of a surprise if you look at some of the data about what neurons are sending their axon terminals into the retrosplenial cortex. That's one way you can address the question of what types of cognitive um, circuits is retrosplenial cortex involved with, and the answer seems to be, the more we look at it, yes. Retrosplenial cortex seems to be almost ubiquitously involved with almost every aspect of cognition. However, more to my point, people who have acquired brain damage within retrosplenial cortex will often exhibit something that we know as topographic amnesia. This is a condition whereby people are unable to orient themselves in their familiar spaces a lot like 
that person who is recounting their experiences. And this can be illustrated when you ask these people to just draw a map of the area around their home. When you do that, and that's shown on the lower right, our person with acquired brain damage is the leftmost map. And when you look at what is different between his map and his son's map, who he lives with, you would notice that a number of orienting features are absent. Maybe it's the library isn't put down in his map, but his son remembered where it was. And the features that our person with brain damage was able to remember, they don't always seem to be in the right position, right? So it seems imperative to understand the retrosplenial cortex and what's going on within the retrosplenial cortex in order to understand this kind of nuanced change to cognitive ability, right? And in order to address that, we're going to have to turn to animal models. Because even though we think that we're very you know, special and unique animals, I don't know of any other animal that went to the moon, um, are the brain regions that we have inside our brain are actually shared across almost all mammals. And so you could look at a monkey's brain and find retrosplenial cortex. You could look at a rat's brain and find retrosplenial cortex. And the rat, in particular, is very useful for us because the retrosplenial cortex is positioned in a place where it's much more accessible to us as scientists. We can listen to the brain rhythms occurring in retrosplenial cortex more easily there and try and understand what are the different types of computations happening and what brain regions might be uh, providing those brain rhythms. So what is the, the main brain rhythm of retrosplenial cortex? Well, it's a relatively famous one in neuroscience circles, and it's called the theta rhythm. This theta rhythm is defined as coming in at seven times per second, so it's seven hertz. And it's really cool because we only see this theta rhythm when these animals are navigating around a space. Now, that could be a space that they know very well. That could be a new space that they've just learned. It could even be a space in virtual reality. It seems to be this cognitive engagement with spatial navigation is getting the retrosplenial cortex to receive signals seven times per second. But that's not the only change that we see in the electrophysiological uh, properties of retrosplenial cortex. If we were to look at all the brain rhythms that occurred when the animals were running, that's gonna be the red line that we see as compared to when the animals were just sitting still. That's that black line in the background. We would notice that a number of brain rhythms are either getting stronger, such as our theta rhythm, or in that purple box, the gamma rhythm. And some rhythms are getting weaker, such as our delta rhythm down there at the low end of the spectrum. Now this is where my colleague's keen eye for detail came in because no one before had really seen a change in rhythms above 100 hertz. Gamma and that kind of 60 to 80 hertz rhythm was about the fastest people would look for and not really disregard, but they just didn't expect to find much faster than that. However, my colleague Megha was able to discover and name a brand new rhythm called splines based on this finding. Now, there's a few things we need to unpack here. And the first one, I think, is how can you see these spline rhythms at the same time as these theta rhythms, right? These theta rhythms are massive. They really dominate the signal that you record. And in order to uh, answer that, what we're able to do is isolate just the rhythms that occur in that yellow box there, the spline rhythms, and juxtapose it underneath our raw data, what we would observe is that these spline rhythms are actually occurring at the same exact time as our theta rhythm, right? So as the theta rhythm voltage is getting higher, that's the most probable time that we would see these spline rhythms. 
And if you were to zoom in on just one of these theta bumps, or what we call in the lab a theta cycle, it kind of looks a little bit like a, a Bart Simpson haircut because you can see that the spline rhythms are sitting right on top of that nice peak. But this is just data from one hemisphere of the brain, right? Retrosplenial cortex sits at this, uh, at this very special place where that superhighway connecting right brain and left brain is. And so what Megha and other colleagues of mine wanted to do is see how these rhythms are different from the right brain to the left brain. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take one theta cycle from the right brain and overlay it on top of one theta cycle from the left brain. When we do that, the first thing that we would notice is that right brain and left brain seem to be synchronized with regard to the theta rhythm. They seem to be following the same beat at seven hertz, so that those troughs and those peaks of the theta rhythm are occurring at the same time, right and left. What that means is that these spline rhythms should also be occurring at the same time from the right brain to the left brain. And when you look at that, that's where the really funny thing happens that hasn't been seen in other brain rhythms as far as I'm aware. And the two hemispheres are completely out of sync. Even though they're participating in the same rhythm, when one hemisphere's voltage is going up, the other hemisphere's voltage is going down, and vice versa. They seem to be taking turns who's got high voltage and who's got low voltage. And in part, this is how splines got their name for the interlocking teeth that gears have that help one gear move another gear. I mentioned that this rhythm is kind of unique in this way, this antiphase relationship, right? Where the peak is in one hemisphere, the trough is in the other, we would call that antiphase. And it's special because if you were to compare it to other rhythms that are co-occurring, such as our gamma rhythm that can also show up at the same time, we'd find that gamma rhythms are also, a lot like the theta rhythm, perfectly locked in from the right hemisphere to the left hemisphere. So something cool is happening seven times a second in the retrosplenial cortex. It's as if the brain is going from perfectly in sync to perfectly out of sync, seven times per second. And this was very provocative, and we wanted to know what the heck does this represent in the brain. We don't yet know what types of computations this spline rhythm is reflecting, but we have a few clues. And that comes from the fact that when animals are running faster, those spline rhythms increase in amplitude. So those deflections in voltage get much higher and much lower, and that's significantly different as compared to the gamma rhythm. What's also very cool is that the timing really tightens up. So that antiphase nature where one is up and the other one's down, that gets even more perfectly antiphase the more fast the animal is running. So this suggests to us in the laboratory that these spline rhythms might be relating to some sort of very fast integration of information. And if you remember from a few of the previous speakers, they've done a great job for me, uh, so I can say this, integrating information seems to be critically important for people who are living with Parkinson's disease, right? How do you unite all these different streams of information? Well, one hypothesis we have is that the spline rhythms might actually reflect that process in the brain. So who's sending the signal, right? I mentioned that these rhythms are related to the inputs coming into these neurons at the same time. And one very likely source of these spline rhythms is the basal forebrain. And on the left, you can see the kind of epic trajectory these neurons have to make with their axon terminals. They send them all the way from the bottom front of your brain, all the way to the back in the middle of your brain. 
And the same thing is true in the rodent models that we've been looking at. This becomes really, really important for us to, to look at when we're considering the relationship to people who are living with Parkinson's disease, because we know from previous work done at the University of Michigan that the basal forebrain's health, and in particular those neurons that release acetylcholine as their signal, the health of those neurons is very highly correlated to the cognitive changes that people might experience as they're living with Parkinson's disease. This gets us right into the, the heart of my work where I'm trying to prove that basal forebrain is generating these spline rhythms. And in order to do that, I'm taking my animal model and I'm recording from the retrosplenial cortex the brain rhythms that are happening and seeing a lot of these theta rhythms. You might also notice sitting right on top of a lot of those theta rhythms are those ultra fast splines. But I'm also, with another electrode, recording the activity of neurons in the basal forebrain. And I'm recording when are they having action potential moments and when are they releasing their signals to retrosplenial cortex. What I've been able to find so far is much like the spline rhythms, these basal forebrain neurons seem to be tightly phase locked to the theta rhythm of retrosplenial cortex. And not only are they phase locked in the same way splines are, they seem to be locked to the exact same phase, the peaks of the theta occurring in retrosplenial cortex. So taken all together, what we might be looking at with spline rhythms is a output signal or a exhaust fume, if you will, that reflects the basal forebrain sending information to the retrosplenial cortex in an ultra-fast manner. And we suspect that this is actually tightly related to the cognitive speed that the animal needs to use to engage in. And so if we were able to find this brain rhythm in people, we might be able to use a very non-invasive technology like magnetic encephalography. It's a lot like EEG, but it lets you get deep down to where the retrosplenial cortex is. We might be able to use a technique like that, look for the presence or absence, or even the amplitude of these spline rhythms, and better predict what the basal forebrain health is and avoiding you know, costly and time-consuming PET scans. However, moving forward, I still have a lot of research that I have to do to prove what spline rhythms are, draw that connection directly to cognition. So I want to first show that the basal forebrain is deterministically creating spline rhythms. And then I want to say, well, what can the animal do to make these spline rhythms stronger or weaker. We know that running faster seems to do that, but is that a motor coordination thing? Is that purely a cognitive thing? And so we're going to do a few experiments to really tease those two lines of thinking apart. And then once we've got our understanding about spline rhythms there, we can do the scientist thing and disrupt them or make them stronger. And when we do that, we would expect these animals that we're altering the spline rhythms in, we would expect them to either be able to remember better, remember worse, or just change what they're remembering, right? There may be some very nuanced change to their cognitive ability that isn't as black and white as they can do it or can't do it. But the gold standard for this research, of course, is to translate it to people so that we can use our knowledge to better predict and inform people of their own brain health. And so if we can take what we know about spline rhythms, look for them in people, and replicate the same types of dynamics, right? So when someone's walking faster, perhaps in virtual reality, so that we could have you sit still for the MEG, as someone's navigating faster, we would expect to see those spline rhythms occur faster. And perhaps in some populations of people who are living with Parkinson's disease and at risk for cognitive changes, 
we might see those spline rhythms not react in the same way that we would expect. They might not have the same relationship to running speed or cognitive speed that we would see in the animal models. And ultimately, we would want to translate this into the clinic sometime in the future so that we can help people. Um, this has been incredibly interesting work. I'm still relatively new at the University of Michigan. So I really want to thank the Udall Institute for giving me the money to do my work and Professor Omar Ahmed for giving me a place to do my work. And especially thank you all for showing up today, willing to learn new things about the brain and uh, bearing with me as I introduce brain rhythms. Thank you.